Hello, good afternoon everybody uh, and welcome to this Hey Digital 2020 event in partnership with Womart and funded by Creative Europe. Uh, my name is Sophie Hughes, I'm translator and co-editor of Europa 28, uh, which we are here to talk about too with three of the participants. Um, it's a real pleasure to, to be here. I, I know that we're not in one another's presence, but it's lovely to be in your company. Uh, I'll dive straight in and introduce our three um, participants. Kapka Krasabova is a British Bulgarian poet and award winning writer of narrative fiction, non fiction, rather, uh, including the really superb Border, A Journey to the Edge of Europe and the follow-up published just this year uh, to that work of crystalline prose and often startling wisdom, which is called To the Lake, A Balkan Journey of War and Peace. And Kapka lives in Scotland and she joins us from Scotland, unsurprisingly, uh, today. Caroline Muscat is one of Malta's uh, foremost uh, and important investigative journalists with principal interests, including, but not uh, limited to press freedom state corruption and human rights. Caroline is also the co-founder and editor of The Shift News, uh, which she co-founded uh, just in the wake of the assassination by car bomb uh, of Malta's foremost investigative journalist, Daphne Caruana Galizia. Uh, and in order to found The Shift News, Caroline resigned from her position as news editor of the Sunday Times of Malta, which is the leading, the country's leading newspaper. And Caroline, we're, we're really delighted to have you join us here from Malta today. Last but not least, we have Zsofia Ban, uh, who's a prize-winning Hungarian writer living and writing in Budapest, where she's also a critic and professor of American studies. Uh, a collection of Zofia's stories is published in English as Night School, a reader for grown-ups, a title I love, and in one review of the book that I've read, uh, a critic seems to quite neatly sum up Zofia's uh, main modus operandi, um, at least uh, literary, literarily speaking, uh, and, and the critic states that she, Zofia rearranges the pieces of cultural history to the delight of the already learned student. And I think we couldn't be in better company today because if I know, hey, I know that we will have somewhere, although we can't see you, a room or a tent full of learned students. So welcome, Jofi. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> There's, a, there's another introduction that must be made today, and that is of the project itself. I hope that you can see here a few post-its, but um, the main point is Europa 28. Uh, writing by women on the future of Europe. This is a book uh, that came out in March uh, and is published by Common Press. It is the book form of the festival of ideas that Europa 28, a Hay, a Hay Festival project, uh, is meant to be and will be. It's just that, of course, like everything else, it's been postponed. So uh, there will be a festival um, bringing together 28 renowned thinkers, uh, scholars, journalists, artists, poets, uh, scientists, the whole smorgasbord of, of wisdom and insight, one from each European Union country. So we've, we've got 28, the book was commissioned a few years ago. Um, and uh, in this festival, uh, the participants that we've chosen uh, will be coming together to discuss their visions for the future of Europe. Um, the project is neatly summed up by something that Kapka Kasabova, who, who we have today, actually said at a talk last year at Hay, and which has stayed with me, which is um, that there is unlimited potential to do things differently. Um, so even when we feel that we're in stalemate, I love this idea of the unlimited potential to do things differently. And Europa 28 really is uh, an embodiment of that idea. Uh, the anthology was co-edited uh, by Sarah Cleave and myself. Um, the Guardian has called it a bright celebration of unity and difference, which is lovely, I think, because of course we like the idea of a celebration of unity and difference. Um, but it's also, I think, and quite importantly, uh, quite a radical anthology uh, in the sense that as a collective narrative, the ideas that come together 
really do or, or can potentially lead to real solutions to some of the pressing problems uh, that, that Europe faces today. Um, it's not a book that bristles with opinion, uh, certainly not hard-headed opinion, uh, but it's replete with ideas, with hopes, memories, uh, disappointments and with feeling. In other words, all the things that make us human, not just European. Uh, I'm going to start today by asking a question to everyone that's that's very broad um, and I know that much like in the anthology where, which were, in which we asked one question we're going to get very different ideas coming from you so um, my, my first question really is the Hay Festival Europa 28 project by 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 its very different definition asked you to recognize yourself at least for the purpose of the project as european but my question is whether or not you have any memories or um, any kind of anecdotes or or any ideas that come to you about a sense for yourself of being European, whether or not it's uh, a realization that in fact you, you don't feel European and can never recognize yourself as European as opposed to some other label, um, or whether or not it's it's a moment, a kind of eureka moment uh, that, 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 did, that did make you feel, you know, very much part, uh, part of the, the, the the union in itself. And um, so I'll start, I think, um, with Jofi, because Jofi, you were actually born and grew up in Brazil, is that right? And then you moved to Hungary yeah. in your in your teens? <coughs> yeah, I was uh, 11, actually, uh, when we moved back in uh, 69. So that's, I guess, one, one, one of those um, uh, crystallized moments when I was sort of uh, parachuted, as as it were, into into a complete into a culture that's completely different from the one uh, I I grew up in, in until then, uh, and uh, and to this day I feel very attached to uh, Brazilian culture, and uh, and of course I follow. Uh, Brazilian politics um, as closely as I can, and um, I, I do feel that I that I have um, very very close ties uh, uh, with Brazilian culture. But when we moved back, that was uh, in fact a very traumatic uh, moment for me. Um, uh, I felt that my my original uh, roots uh, that that I had been uprooted, as it were, which was true in a sense, and uh, I had to uh, um, uh, come to terms with uh, well, for instance, a completely <coughs> different school system, which was very strongly um, ideological that I was certainly not used to, and I had to adjust myself. Uh, to that, I've, I've often written about that experience, including uh, the book that you mentioned, um, Night School, uh, in which one of the chapters is about um, this trauma of having to switch cultures, of being uprooted from the one, uh, um, even if even if not for uh, tragic reasons as for instance uh, the uh, the plight of the refugees nowadays um, you know it was just an event that completely changed my perspective of the world and which certainly hasn't disappeared with with my having uh, become a, a Hungarian and a, and a European and um, if uh, um, you're asking about uh, when, uh, if I if I understood you correctly, when I when I I, I realized that at, that at the most um, uh, uh, powerfully, I I I guess there was there was there's no better moment to uh, refer to than uh, 1989 or 1990 uh, when. Um, uh, the um, the Iron Curtain fell, you know, as someone who had been living behind the Iron Curtain uh, since my early teens. I guess that was um, the um, 
the single uh, m probably most important moment when we all felt that we were back uh, where we belonged, uh, which, which is Europe, which is in fact where we geographically find ourselves, which is the heart of Europe, the very center. Uh, even though politically uh, we, we, we did live uh, on the margins. So that, that became, um, I think for all of us uh, in Europe, but especially in, in Eastern Europe, a moment, uh, a moment of, of um, not only of, of joy and euphoria, but a moment um, in which I think all of us um, reappropriated our original identity, uh, which is which is basically a European identity. Thank you. I'm going to um, move on to Kapka in, in, and ask Kapka in response to what Jofi has just said. Um, and whether that's something that you have heard in 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 your research for your books, which um, often is on, on the Balkans, and um, whether or not this is a recognisable to you, this sense of eu euphoria and coming back home, back to back to being European, um, whether that's something that you have heard in your research. And also, I want to ask you about your own sense uh, again about your you know your own feelings about being both British and Bulgarian. Uh, I, I have to I have to say um, 1989 um, was the turning point um, I think for a lot of people of my generation as, as Sophia explained uh, for the reasons uh, that she explained it was a moment of um, when we glimpsed the potential for wholeness and I think it's fair to say that the people of the Balkans um, have a complicated relationship with their Europeanness and with the concept of Europe as a whole um, and that is you know some of the yeah, some of that is explored in in border and to the lake um, but for me personally I think the moment when I realized I was European was when we emigrated to New Zealand I was in my late teens then I spent 12 years in New Zealand, uh, my late teens and 20s. And living in New Zealand was, uh, you know, a kind of revelatory um, experience and phase of my life in many ways, but partly because I understood um, what it was that I missed about Europe, which is why I returned to Europe, that is to say, Scotland, uh, 15 years ago. And it's this feeling of everything being incredibly old, complicated, and a certain familiarity, I think, often repressed uh, with trauma, often generational trauma. And certainly the Iron Curtain um, is a recent of that, of that um, collective trauma that, that Europeans experienced and recovered from, at least partially. Um, and um, I think, I, you know, I, for I, a lot of us, the No, go ahead, Kapka, please. I think for my generation, you know, there is this thing of there is before 1989 and after 1989, just as I mm. think for many in the former Yugoslavia, there is um, before the war and after the war. And I think these are important of, of what it means to be European and then mm. the ability to recover, you know, to sort of uh, rise yourself from the ashes, uh, mm. which is what, of course, the European Union represents that rising from the ashes of, um, of, of, of a Holocaust. Um, mm. And it's, I think it's useful to remember that. I think, I mean, I, I'm certainly not. Um, comparing Brexit to the fall of the Iron Curtain, but for, for a generation, Brexit will be um, <coughs> will be a defining moment, at least. Um, and, and one of the ironies for me about Brexit is that um, our, 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 our um, kind of separation from the Union 
from the European Union has made many people's sense of being European, many British people's sense of being European has, has been made replete. Um, I, 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 I think that possibly the answer for certainly one, one generation in this country to the question of at what point did you feel European must be at the moment when we voted to leave the Union, I imagine it, it will it will be that. I mean, you only have to remember that um, the Google searches for what is the European Union once the vote had passed um, were, were at an all time high. Um, I'll, I'll move on now to, to Caroline and I'm going to slightly rephrase the question for you, Caroline, because um, in Malta, recently, and you've been investigating this, um, among other things, but uh, we know that the sale of, of golden passports, of these Maltese passports that, of course, come come with membership to the European Union, uh, is, is a rife practice at the moment. And, of course, in, the, in their selling, they are also, there is also kind of implicit invitation for criminal activity most, most um, obviously and markedly money laundering. So my question is, to you is whether you think that the selling of a Maltese passport, a European passport, in some way undermines the principles that make being European appealing. <laughs> uh, so, you know, rule of law and the kind of um, uh, st strong, strong democracy. Uh, yeah, so I wonder if you could answer that for us. <clears throat> well, um... There have been several reports uh, by, the Europe, by the European Commission, by the European Parliament, several independent um, uh, non-governmental organizations that have shown that the selling of European citizenship has opened uh, the door to money laundering, corruption and crime. So um, this is an established fact. It is also um, evidenced by uh, cases where, for example, in Malta, in one year, five individuals who had just acquired Maltese passports, that is European passports, um, were arrested in foreign jurisdictions for crimes committed. So why we keep talking about, you know, due diligence, or, uh, proper due diligence, um, being able to create a barrier and protect us, um, the, the years in which uh, this scheme has been going on, and it is not only by Malta, there are other European countries doing it, but not that many, mostly it's about uh, residential visas, not passports. Uh, but there is a clear, a clear problem. Uh, that has been now highlighted for a, for, for a number of years. And the uh, measures uh, to address such concerns um, have not, have not uh, removed them. So essentially, we have a problem on our hands. In terms of an identity, I, I, am, I, I am not somebody who, who it subscribes to, to a national identity or a regional identity um, so much. Um, however, having said that, simply because we are individual characters, different values, etc., and the idea of Europe should encompass um, diversity and all the values that, that we hold dear. Still, having said that, uh, the European project is a project set on divine, defined values, solidarity, um, peace, openness, freedom, equality, that uh, need to be, in my view, preserved. Because if, if we lose that, if we lose the idea of um, what Europe, what the foundation of Europe is, especially at a time when the fundamental freedoms that we worked so hard um, to achieve are, are at risk. And I think that especially in this period, uh, the COVID period, the coronavirus period, um, we are facing new social, political and economic pressures that have further undermined the rights that we take for granted. So a crisis that should have shown us the importance of solidarity instead saw, for example, uh, nations working, working on their own. It saw individuals you know, st stockpiling, hoarding, hoarding, hoarding basic necessities. We missed, I think it showed up, the weakness of a concept 
uh, it showed up our flaws. It showed up that uh, we did we didn't see so much solidarity. Um, we have the the issues that we have that are the, the, the dark underbelly of Europe, migration, for example. Um, we have seen under COVID that these that that uh, the human rights rights such as press freedom etc were the first things to go out the window we've had an experience with this in malta when 12 people drowned at sea so i think the the important thing uh, to say i mean it our identity does not only come from our passport the passport is a problem it is one thing but how i think the important thing that we need to define is the future, the, the Europe in which we want to live in together. Um, we have to understand, we have, I think the, the book um, that, that we've put together really has, uh, you said it so beautifully in your introduction, that it has one common theme. It asks us to look, it asks us to gaze. And I think that if we all take a step back and keep in mind the fundamental values and keep in mind that we have a responsibility to stand up for them, then, then together as a Europe redefining it, we can move forward and, and uh, really um, write a different future for ourselves, essentially. Caroline, I want to carry on with and ask you a, a, another question, which I hope will feed into and so that you uh, give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about more about your piece. Um, but it follows on from what you've just said in the sense that um, preserving these values uh, will involve uh, preserving the truth, um, sharing the truth, uh, not, not obstructing the truth. And my question is really about press freedom because this is something that you have uh, seen the, the erasure of uh, to extreme degrees in the last few years, shocking degrees. It perhaps shouldn't shock us, but we you know within Europe to see a lead, a country's leading journalist assassinated, um, essentially because she was uncovering uncomfortable truths, or, 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 or essentially, that, you know, definitely that's what was going on. Um, it's it's shocking to us, but is this something that you you think is is spreading i get the sense you know one gets the sense that this is this uh, not just the calling out of fake news so to speak but um the undermining of the press the coercion the silencing but also the self-censorship that that violence towards journalists will eventually and ultimately cause is something that you th you think is not an isolated isolated within malta but is very much spreading and will have an effect on on all of our freedoms uh, yes, one of one of the things I say in my in, in, in my chapter is that Malta is only a theater in a much larger conflict. Uh, and the reason why I mentioned COVID is that the, 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 the freedoms, including press freedom, that were already under threat in Europe, uh, have now been dealt a severe blow, blow. You can see them in places, for example, like Hungary where you have a new bill where, in which the president can rule by degree. And the, and the reason given for that is to control fake, fake news about the, the, the pandemic. That is not the only case. There's a number of these cases going on in Europe. So whereas a, where, a, where, where a crisis should, should open opportunity, show us our flaws and teach us a way forward, it is instead being used by governments to, 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 to gain even more ground in a battle where the other side is kind of, you know, in quarantine, so so it's quite a difficult battle battle to to, to fight right now. In Malta, mm -hmm. it is it is it is it is extremely felt because we um, we we are in a campaign to seek justice for for the assassination of Daphne Caruana Galizia, who was killed in a, by a car bomb in a brutal way. And, uh, in October 2017, and just as after two years, we managed to 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 have a public inquiry launched to really find out what happened in the case and how importantly how we can prevent this from happening in future. Um, it all came to a halt suddenly with COVID. So why we're res opening restaurants and cafes and this kind of thing? The courts are the last thing we're going to open. So mm. so. The, the the demand the need the the, the need to um, 
really, really speak up for these values. I will talk, I will talk about the, the um, and Daphne and the chapter in a bit more detail because it's quite specific to Malta. But what I want to stress here, this is not a problem that is only related to one island in, in the European Union. Jan, Jan Kuchak and, and his fiance were, were killed in Slovakia uh, a few months later. And the reason why the battle for justice is important in these countries is that this thing is, can never become the new normal. These are things that are unacceptable and we have to absolutely dig our heels in and fight for these freedoms. We all have a responsibility to play in that because the attack against these journalists was not about killing them. It was a message to all of us. It was a message to silence us. It was an attack against people's right to know. So this is not a battle about state versus journalism versus, you know, it's not about fake news. There are tools that we can, that, that, and, and laws that we can use like we use with any other problem to identify and, and, and create standards. But it, the public must make sure that they defend this very basic right, because without the rights to know, I mean, democracy, this is the fourth pillar of democracy. What else do you have left? For example, the shift, the shift news, which you founded, is, is the sole independent news outlet in Malta, isn't it? It's the only one, you're the only people who don't, don't take donations from kind of... Uh, we, we, have a, we have a media landscape in the country that is dominated by uh, uh, ownership, direct ownership by the, by the two main political parties. So you only have a handful of independent media uh, in, in, in between all this. And most are still, they, they depend on, on government and state advertising. So we, when we launched the shift, we took a very conscious decision that we had to set a direction that we ref absolutely refuse direct or indirect advertising from government. So we, even if there's an election or whatever, which is, which is a time when, when media, you know, any, any, any news channel will, will, it, it's a good fundraising opportunity for them. We reject even indirect advertising. So even when there's a political campaign going on, we are the only news website that is completely clean. It is obviously it presents a different, a, a very difficult channel a challenge in terms of, you know, the, the more, all the models that are out there, all the models that we know in terms of uh, how a newsroom survives advertising and all these things. Um, we had to create an entirely new um, multi revenue model. Uh, that we've been perfecting over the last two years and continues to develop. So it's a challenge, but our, our belief is that we need to have a different media. And create support, by which I mean readership for this other media, of the, course. The, um, the community value of it is important, yes. Thank you. I, I feel that with this event, I should add that we could probably have each one of you speaking for 45, well, easily have what each one of you speaking for 45 minutes. But with 28 participants, I think 28 hour run would be a little bit too much for, for any of us. Um, but I'm going to move on, um, Katka, to ask you a little bit about your piece, which is called Two Lakes. Um, first, if you could perhaps introduce a little bit about uh, what the piece is and why this piece was your response to the question um what does your future for the what does your what is your vision for the future of europe how you came to to write the piece um and also i was really struck by the by the way you turned the question on its head and you ask who has a future and you say those who don't get caught up in war and those who remember the, the, the hard lessons of the, par the past, as a paraphrasing your beautiful prose. Um, and you also write in there that geography shapes history, which seems to me like it could almost be a, a motto for, for your writing as a whole. And um, what Katka does in, in her writing, in her narrative nonfiction, is, is, is uh, makes um, geographical places makes the spaces that she visits or turns them almost into archaeological digs where she um uh kind of processes you know uncovers processes and then records stories uh and 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 hidden truths in order to recreate the narrative of the space or perhaps um you know to to also give us lessons for for how to how we can behave in the future um Katka, tell us a bit more about your piece, if you will. 
the French filmmaker Agnès Varda, who um, who passed away a couple of years ago, uh, said that people carry landscapes, and and I agree with that. Uh, we all carry places, whether they are landscapes in the uh, classic sense of the word, or cityscapes, or certainly places. Um, that we are in constant inner conversation with. They might even be ancestral places or places where we've not necessarily spent a long time. Uh, and I'm very interested in my writing in this dynamic, this chemistry between a human being and, and her place. Um, and so for this piece, Two Lakes, um, at the heart of it is a walk, a hike around these two lakes. In fact, a hike up to the top of the mountain that separates these two lakes in the southwest Balkans. Um, a mountain separates the lakes on the surface, but underground they are connected by rivers and streams and springs. It's an extraordinary um, ecosystem, uh, probably about three million years old. Um, and at the same time, these two lakes are separated by a triple national border. So three countries share these two lakes, um, Macedonia or North Macedonia now, Albania and Greece. So a hike to the top of this karstic mountain between the two lakes um, is, is an opportunity to survey, um, survey the landscape, as it were. Um, it's, it's a place that has seen many wars um, and war and peace is part of the title of this book a journey to the lake to the book on which this essay is based to the, to the lake a journey of war and peace but when i look at war and peace i'm really interested in the psychological dimension of um, what ultimately becomes uh, a collective experience and so in this piece, um, a simple walk turns into a kind of excavation of, of collective history. Um, mm -hmm. And it's embodied by this conversation, which becomes increasingly tense between me and my guide, um, who is a mountain ranger. And we, we get to explore our feelings of war and peace in relation to this place and these lakes and our nations and our families and the Balkans, which is a microcosm of Europe, uh, just as Caroline said, Malta is a microcosm of Europe. And again, we can't talk about Europe without talking about um, the future of humanity and our essential humanity. And this is really what we're up against at the moment, or rather what the challenge of our time is um, to not how to hold on to our Europeanness, or even the question is not anymore what is it what is it to be European, but what what is it to be a human being? How to be a human being? I think that that's really the question we're all um, we're all trying to figure out. And looking looking all of your work. Um asks us to sort of look back to the personal stories in order to possibly come together as I, I take from this to come together to remember constructively i mean there's there's almost a psychological element to your work in that sense a kind of working through by focusing on the local and um, i wondered yeah, i think i think we're going to have to move on yeah, yeah so go I ahead is by exploring a subject in an embodied manner so not in an abstract disembodied manner so in that sense i'm interested in in what a place and its people uh, reveals in an embodied way in an encountered based what based way um, because it's easy to kind of get carried away in abstractions um, and i think being here and the whole question of europeanness is is an abstraction after all uh, until we actually get down to the experience um, that individuals have and nations have. And, you know, ultimately, I think it comes down to emotional experiences. That's, that's where insight lies, I think. The rest is abstraction. 
if 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 what you're hearing Katka say um strikes a chord with you as it does with me then i i really recommend i'm i'm not just trying to tout this book but i recommend that you at least take a look at it um the europa anthology because it's precisely about that one of the was precisely about this coming together and having a conversation and tapping into emotions um rather than hearing always the same old sort of usually male political voices in our in our ears um, we're not shunning experts on any level these are all um, experts for want of a better word in their fields um, but we're asking for kind of different entry ways to think about Europe um, and it almost is like this book has become almost like a living map of Europe suddenly when I think of these countries I don't think about them as spaces anymore but as as people um, and, and, it, and it's extraordinary just how one anthology has, I think, has that capacity and that power. Um, we're going to move on to Jofi now. Um, Jofi Aban, your piece, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about it, because it was the one that Sarah Cleave, the co-editor of the anthology, and I read and wrote to each other immediately and said, this is amazing because it's so unexpected because what you do is uh, we ask you about the future of Europe and you thrust us back into the, the industrial revolution and imagine uh, a relationship or a friendship between two real figures, Victor Hugo and Sadie Cardinal. And if you could tell us a little bit about why you do that and also w what the inspiration for the piece was. Yeah, thanks, Sophie. Uh, but before I, I do that, I need to um, uh, return to uh, some of Caroline's uh, words that we uh, just heard, uh, especially the, uh, the reference to what has been going on um, in terms of politics under, under COVID and um, that we suddenly find ourselves in a, in a um, I'm speaking of course uh, from uh, the Hungarian perspective, we suddenly find ourselves in a, in a kind of double uh, crisis or triple crisis. One is uh, obviously the virus crisis, uh, the other is the crisis in domestic politics and the third is um, the, the, the global crisis, including the European one as a result um, of the virus. And here I'm specifically uh, also referring to what Caroline already mentioned, which uh, is, for instance, that um, during the, um, uh, the years in which uh, our present uh, government has been uh, ruling, there has been a complete uh, uh, co-optation of, um, of, of the press uh, and the media by the government, um, you know, public media outlets, both uh, radio, television and newspapers um, have been uh, uh, totally co-opted by the government and have uh, been using it uh, exclusively for um, government propaganda and um, so freedom of the press uh, at this moment in Hungary is very dubious, uh, highly problematic and uh, as Caroline also mentioned, um, the government unfortunately has used the COVID crisis as a pretext uh, to, um, um, to rule by decree which even though at this point, uh, uh, apparently the, uh, the pandemic has um, receded in Hungary, but that situation uh, is still uh, going on at present, the ruling by decree. And under the guise and pretext of uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, certain laws uh, have been uh, brought um, almost as it were in the background um, using all you know the attention that everyone is now paying um, primarily to the pandemic uh, situation uh, they have introduced new laws during the past two three four weeks uh, that infringe on uh, human rights infringe on the uh, 
the um, autonomy of, uh, of cultural institutions as well as um, educational institutions. So I, I just had to add that uh, before answering your question on my piece. Uh, which is, in fact, um, um, it, it, it stems from, uh, you know, when, when uh, uh, we were commissioned to write a piece uh, about uh, Europe for this uh, wonderful anthology, um, just a few weeks uh, had passed, in fact, uh, since uh, the burning of the Notre Dame and I just couldn't think of any any more um, um, proper uh, symbol uh, for um, uh, European history, European culture, uh, which all of a sudden, due to um, an accident, an unexpected event, all of a sudden goes up in flames and which brings about uh, a, a trauma, which causes a trauma uh, for the whole of Europe. So I, I, I somehow saw that building as the building of the whole of uh, European history, European culture, and um, so, an, an event uh, that, that, um, that, that, you know, the, the whole story stemmed from from that event. And of course, one thing led to another, as it often does in fiction. Uh, associations happen, obviously, when you think of the burning of the Notre Dame, you think of Victor Hugo uh, and uh, his novel in which he describes uh, the earlier uh, burning of that same building. Uh, and, um, and, and, and so I, I, you know, I thought, I thought of, a, of, of, to write a story, to create a piece of fiction in which something good, uh, can also come from a crisis, which in the context of the story is, uh, the power of, of heat that, that fire creates. And, um, this is, and in fact, since they lived in the same era, I imagine um, uh, a friendship between Sadi Carnot and um, and uh, and Victor Hugo. And uh, Carnot, of course, is the one who uh, who first came up uh, with uh, the basic uh, rules and laws of thermodynamics, in which he wanted to investigate uh, uh, how uh, the power. Uh, of heat uh, can be put to use. And so I, I felt that this um, could be used as a, as, as, as a symbolic story for the whole of Europe of how we can put to positive use the, the, the joint traumas that we uh, experience together uh, and how, how we can create some kind of energy uh, stemming from these uh, joined traumas, so that's that's, exa that's exactly less, what comes yeah. across from the piece. And one of the most um, mm. surprising and kind of uh, stimulating and infusing parts about your your story is that um, Sadie Cardinot is, is locked up in an asylum because people consider this idea to be just too wild and, 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 and they think he's mad, the idea of preserving, you know, energy. Um, and so I, I wondered as well whether or not, and after this we're going to go to your questions to the audience, but I wonder whether or not there was an element of that, a sense that, um, as Kapka, I quoted Kapka as saying, this unlimited potential for change. There's something very hopeful in the idea that perhaps if we could just harness some of the wisdom and intelligence and, you know, uh, uh, kind of bravery that uh, scientists are, are and, and, and all sorts of thinkers are coming up with, if we can harness them listen to them, listen to new voices, whether or not that will, that offers more hopeful vision for the future of Europe as well. Yeah, I just, I just feel, and that's what I wanted to put in my story as well, that you, you need a sudden change of perspective 
you need a sudden change in 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 approach, uh, which is what uh, Zadi does in 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 the story. And even if it um, at first seems um, you know like a long shot. Uh, we 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 need to keep those um, uh, those um, uh, doors open to voices and ideas that approach the same old same old problems from a completely different perspective, uh, yeah. which you know is putting to use uh, the the creativity that we have all that all these buildings, both in a metaphoric and a, and a literal sense, have been built on. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. We're going to take uh, questions to the audience. I'm going to start with a question for you, Caroline. Um, and this comes from Tom. Tom asks you, uh, do you think that developments this year mean that there is any sign of cultural shift in Maltese politics? Has the EU brought effective pressure to bear? Well, <clears throat> I there have been developments in the past year uh, in terms of um, uh, the justice for 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 the assassination of Daphne Caruana Galizia um, and the changes and reforms required uh, in in uh, reforms in terms democratic reforms in the country also reforms for the to ensure the rule of law um, whether this um, shows a cultural shift, I mean, there were protests for two months every day uh, in, in Malta towards the end of last year. We closed 2019, November and December over the Christmas period and New Year, um, campaigning and protesting. People were protesting on the streets on a daily basis. We had um, resignations, we, what, what we call here the triumvirate of corruption. Um, each of these three members, who are the Prime Minister Joseph Muscat, the former Prime Minister Joseph Muscat, his Chief of Staff, Keith Cambry, and uh, their Star Minister, Conrad Mitzi, all these three people are involved in all the corruption scandals that have been uh, exposed by the press um, and since, since this government has been in power. Whether this represents a cultural shift? No. We have had a face change, so to speak. We've had a facelift. Okay, we have we have changed the face of our prime minister. We have seen absolutely um, uh, that there's been no no arrests by by, by the police. We have seen uh, the new prime minister who was very clearly who very clearly um, was installed there with the very clear support of the former prime minister and who has not moved um, anything forward in terms of addressing impunity. So no, there has been no cultural shift in Malta. The, 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 the battle continues. And as I said before, um, uh, this is not a Maltese battle. This is a European battle. In that sense, European institutions have been um, incredibly, incredibly uh, helpful in guiding the Maltese government on where reforms should be heading. For example, the Venice Commission on reforms on the rule of law. Uh, in terms of uh, the Council of Europe, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, thanks to their efforts, we managed to get a public inquiry, which the government in Malta had resisted for two years. So yes, Europe has a function. Europe is applying the pressure. Europe also respects national sovereignty. So we can't continue to blame Europe for what our government doesn't do. Uh, but at the same time, we need to strengthen European institutions uh, in, with, to cope with new challenges, not only the old ones, because our challenges are now different. The, 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 the institutions that we set up um, were dealing with the problems at the time. As we said, even a crisis like COVID has given us new problems. So I think we need to... Uh, the Commission itself has said that it's going to start a conference on the future of Europe. Um, so the discussion is there. Uh, it has been delayed again because of, because of the whole pandemic. But uh, there is an awareness that the discussion needs to be held. The important thing, I feel, is that citizens all over Europe understand that this debate is as good as their participation, as good as them voicing their demands. Otherwise, we go back 
to, I mean, to, there's no reform. We're going to go back to the same old thinking heads and we're going to get the same solutions. So if we want a different Europe, we all have to speak up. We all have to, to say our wild different views because that's important. Because otherwise we're going to end up with a status quo. Thank you. We've, we've, we're running a little bit over, but we've got time for one more question, which I'm going to ask to um, Kabka and Jofi. Um, it, this is a question from Flora, um, and I'm shortening it a little bit. Sorry, Flora. But the main gist is here. Why do you think, even though we're all more similar than not, spoilers on from Caroline, that it is so easy for us to be divided? Kapka, maybe if you could start, and then Zofi, uh, another short answer. Sorry. That's that's uh, almost a kind of um, well, it's a philosophical question. It's an age-old question. You might even say it's a spiritual question. Um, you know, at, at at the level of I suppose at the level of our humanity, which is, I think, our most precious. Um, attribute and also um, you know um, it, it's what emerges at times of crisis at that level we are always whole and we are always similar uh, but it, it is at, at, at the you know at the further level down of politics and the use of language the misuse of language um, misinformation um, manipulative behavior and behavior spreads because it's highly infectious like a virus and mm -hmm. i think feelings are also highly infectious so at that next level down where we are when where we are encouraged to lose sight of our humanity that's that's where we become prone to divisions and that's our challenge now. You know, it's useful to remember that we are, we have entered the 2020s. The number two, you know, we have left the ones behind us. The number two is, an, is a number of collaboration um, and togetherness. It's, it's a very clear sign um, of our times that, 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 is, that is what's required of all of us, you know, to continue embodying um, that which we share. Jofi, really quickly, I'm sorry if, if you have anything to add on that. Thank you. Sure. I think I think the main reason is is fear mongering, uh, which is which is um, carried out based on political interests, uh, which of course um, relies on ignorance, usually on lack of information, uh, which relies on the fact that people uh, uh, have 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 no facts. Uh, uh, and knowledge to rely on to realize uh, the similarities instead of the differences and and of course it's always the differences uh, that are uh, or the or the or the false differences the fake differences that are um, um, uh, pointed out uh, uh, to 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 support the the fear mongering that politics uh, takes advantage of and I think we should uh, uh, acknowledge this and that we should constantly reflect on the fact that it is being done uh, on a daily basis and we have to be aware of that. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We're going to wrap up here. Um, if you like the sound of this, I find it hard to imagine that people don't find that inspirational, but also um, moving and thought provoking. Um, here is the anthology Europa 28. We also have another Hay Festival digital talk on the same anthology, but with different um, participants uh, at 630 this evening, so in a couple of hours. Um, so please join us and thank you very much to Hay for the project in itself, to all of the translators, to uh, the editors and the publishers of the book. Uh, and we will hopefully see you at 6.30. Thank you.